All right, hi everybody. Welcome to When a Tornado Meets a Volcano, the 2021 Digital Marketing Trends presented by us here at Trevera. We're really excited to have you here today. I am Christina Stetter. I'm the EVP here at Trevera. Let's just do some quick introductions. Jackie, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi everyone, I'm Jackie Costa. I'm on the SEO and content marketing team here. Perfect, Ivana, can you introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Ivana Skoko and my focus at Trivera is around search marketing and digital advertising. All right, so let's look at what we're gonna do today. So first I'm going to take about two minutes to talk about Trivera. Those of you who have been on our webinars before know I do this pretty quickly, it's pretty painless and it is not an endless sales pitch. So no timeshare presentations today. Then we're going to take just a minute to talk about where we're at now and how we got to where we are today. So just level setting our heads so we're all in the same place. We're going to cover four either trends, patterns, or observations. You can call them whatever you want. The first one is communication moving online and whether that's good or not. We'll talk about how the business world attempted to duplicate itself virtually. Then we'll talk about something which I'm sure you can all relate to, which is every day feeling exactly the same. And then because it's a Trevera webinar, we have to talk about Google and search engine optimization. At the end, we will cover six recommendations that we have for you on what you can do in 2021 to deal with everything that happened. Let's start by going back to 1996. That's when Trevera started as a company called Website Solutions. Back then, all we did was build little static websites that showed up on very small screens. And the philosophy back then was you built a website and it lasted forever. Things have really changed. 25 years later in 2021, we are a full service digital marketing agency. Search engine optimization, which wasn't even a thing back in 1996 is a big part of what we do. And we really work hard to combine marketing and design expertise with smart data-driven decision-making. We want to be more creative than a traditional website developer and more technologically driven than a traditional agency. We have some awesome clients, people we love working with. Some of these people have been with us for nearly our 25 year history. You'll look and you'll see some names you recognize and you might see some you don't. You'll also notice that we don't really work in any one vertical and we actually think that that's an advantage. A lot of times we're able to bring things that we learn from one industry into a completely different industry. And the fun thing for us is we get to learn something new every single day. Another thing you should know about Trevera is that we are a certified Google partner. Google is changing constantly. When we start to talk about Google later on today, you will be blown away by all of the things that they are doing to search engines. And when you're a certified Google partner, you have to have a certain number of people who are trained and then pass tests given by Google. But in addition to that, we have to do a certain amount of business with Google and we have to achieve a certain level of results. So we can't just train and test we have to actually execute on what we learn and we have to be good at it. All right, enough about Trevera. Let's talk about where we are at right now. So if you look at this list, you can see these are all of the things that we lived through in the last year. And you might be thinking, what does this list have to do with digital marketing? Well, the truth is we are all people. So yes, I'm sitting here obviously at home talking to you and I'm alone in this room and you're probably alone in the room that you're in, but at the either end of these screens are people. And we can remember, think back, 2020 started with great hopes. There were all these things about 2020 vision. And then we had a lockdown in March. And then in April, Breonna Taylor was shot by the police. In May, George Floyd and the Christian Cooper Central Park incident happened on the same weekend. We had a turbulent summer followed by a contentious election, followed by even more craziness. So when you think about how we have lived through COVID, murder hornets, forest fires, hurricanes, I think we all deserve a survivor trophy and a t-shirt for getting through this year. And for those of us who are here who did get through the year, we all had very different experiences. 
So some companies were able to pivot what they did and maybe offer a related good or service to something they had always done. And that kept them in business and really opened up new opportunities for them. Other companies were like Trevera, where we were in the right place at the right time. And if you wanted to communicate, you needed to do it digitally. And so we had a wonderful time learning about new businesses, helping companies find ways to reach their target audiences and supporting their growth throughout this year. So for us, it was very exciting. But then there were other companies, like if you were in the hospitality industry, it was incredibly difficult because your business relied on that face-to-face -face interaction. And a lot of the things that you wanted to do just couldn't happen, either because of regulation or it just plain old wasn't safe. And then there was the whole social awareness component that happened throughout the year. So there were different ways that companies reacted to this. Some were very connected to social issues. They had always been connected to social issues. And so for them, responding to everything that was going on was natural and it made sense. Other companies felt the pressure, but it wasn't something they'd ever really thought about. And so they weren't quite sure what to do. Some companies wanted to participate and have a voice and other companies felt that they wouldn't be able to be an authentic voice within the presentation. And so they didn't want to talk about it at all. They felt that it was best if they just continued business as usual. And none of these approaches is wrong. We were just all in different places at our companies. So how did we react to all of these things that were going on? Well, Google data shows that there are five basic responses to uncertainty. People either try to regain control, they seek comfort in the familiar, they turn to basics, or they become very self-sufficient. Or last but not least, we saw a lot of this through data that especially at the beginning of the pandemic, always on became a lifeline, not a distraction. So now that we have talked about kind of where we're at, we wanna talk about some trends that we saw. Now I need to preface this by saying that typically when we're researching this presentation, we're able to identify a certain number of trends that we see a lot of people following. One of the things you're going to notice as we present data is that in many cases, we're going to present conflicting data because the trend kind of is that there is no trend. There is stuff all over the place. So what we're going to be presenting is sort of four patterns or observations. You can call them whatever you want, but these are things that are affecting the way you will need to be marketing in 2021. So before we get started, I wanna take a poll. So give me a second to fire this thing up. Alrighty, so you should see a poll on your screen. There are two questions, so be sure to scroll down to the second one. What I'd like you to do is to show us what changes did you make to your marketing strategy in 2020? So did you try anything new? Please tell us what you tried and you can pick as many of these things as you want. And then the second question is based on what you tried, what do you plan to focus on for 2021? And same thing, you can pick as many of these as you want. So if everyone could please Pick something and I will share the results with you once we've got the polling in. Awesome, we just need a couple more responses and we should be all set. All right, I'm gonna give you a couple more. All right, now you folks, I can see that you're not voting. See, you don't know this, but I can see this. Do you see our chat? Yes. <laughs> yeah, you're right. The guy in the picture did have too much coffee. All righty. So I'm gonna end the polling here and share the results with you. So what we can see is a lot of people updated their website and that is, makes perfect sense because if you think about it, this is a space that you own. So it can't be taken away from you. Social media can't change their algorithm and things don't disappear. So that's perfect. We also noticed that some people increased blogging. You might've changed your targeting or increased your social media or pay-per-click advertising. 
And then for our second question, I can see that a lot of people continue, are planning to continue to focus on their new targeting and messaging. And then if you look at this, you'll see a lot of responses that are kind of all over the place. And that's actually good because it aligns with what Jackie is about to share with you now. So let me minimize that for myself. All right, Jackie. There you go. Well, it is interesting to see all your responses being so varied because that is what our first trend is all about, uh, trying to find ways to regain control. And this first pattern shows that a lot of communication was moved online, which is, um, which is one great way to regain control. New research from the Content Marketing Institute shows that 88% of marketers actually changed the way they did content marketing because of the pandemic. And 83% said they did made the shift pretty quickly. Those same marketers were asked their opinions about the changes. And as you can see here on this graph, those opinions also varied, but the majority of the B2B marketers in this survey said that moving their communications online was effective and that they'll keep doing it. One of the biggest changes B2B companies made in 2020 was to invest in pay-per-click advertising, which um, was a category that saw a huge jump. Um, in fact, a 51 to 65% increase. But did it make sense? Well, for B2B marketers, it did. That CMI study found that advertising online, whether it be on social media or with paid search, actually won the last 12 months, producing the best results for these B2B marketers compared to other paid content channels. However, all that awesome just can't be sustained. Um, the increased competition led to increased costs for social and PPC advertising, including uh, display advertising. And that, of course, depends on your industry, your keywords, your targeting, and a couple other things. We saw this to be true at Trevera, but it's also true globally. Just take a look at the rainbow here. And undoubtedly, this uh, change will lead to a strategy change for B2B marketers in the months ahead. Uh, so what, what can they do? What do you expect them to do now? Well, 70% of the organization said that they were going to probably go back to basics and focus on content creation, while others, about 66%, said that they're going to work on website enhancements. This could be a function of what they learned last year, but of course we don't really know because it was 2020. <laughs> However, all of that CMI research does not mesh at all with research uh, from the Marketing Research Center at UMass. Uh, the folks there worked on a B to C behavior study and found that during the pandemic, 77% of Fortune 500 companies actually use their blogs to connect with customers. And that was up 54% from the year before. And only 15% of those respondents said that they allowed comments on their blogs, which is down from two years ago. And uh, the other crazy part about this study is that researchers found social media use was down. And of course, the UMass study conflicts with another study that found an increase in social media use among consumers. I mean, who didn't watch haircut tutorials or people dancing on TikTok these last couple months? Just look at all these increases. 40% use increase in Instagram, Facebook use, 30% increase, YouTube views, 30% up, and TikTok has been downloaded from the App Store more than 33 million times. 
plus all those influencers were producing more content than ever before, probably because stay-at-home orders didn't allow them to do much else. How, <laughs> but um, I guess we wanted to find out why they did it. Well, it's because it made them feel good, at least at the beginning of the pandemic, social media helped people feel less lonely and less stress. It was cheap therapy. But then as we moved on, we saw this study from Brandwatch, which actually looked at online use between January 14 and October 2020. And we saw reports of digital fatigue, account uh, deletion, detoxing, and doom scrolling, which is a great word that is, uh, talks about the cons consuming large amounts of negativity, which peaked in early November, by the way. And then um, is just plain old detrimental to your mental health causes stress, it causes anxiety, lack of focus, and a decrease in productivity. Brandwatch says that social media fatigue, being bored or tired or exhausted, increased 41% in the last 10 months compared to 10 months before that. All of this sort of leads us into our second pattern, which is duplicating the business world and trying to make it work virtually. So because some people and organizations had this more abrupt shift to online and digital, as Jackie mentioned, we all know a lot of trial and error has been occurring, right? When people are starting to use this technology more. You're on mute became sort of this comical slogan for 2020. And we know there's always been people who weren't really good at technology or were slower to adapt, but it didn't matter as much in the more in the past. Now it was sort of more obvious who could figure it out and who couldn't. So we ended up with a lot of viral quarantine conference calls with people not wearing pants and going to the bathroom. And even those that you know sort of do know what they're doing aren't immune to it. Like the three of us were just on a webinar this week where the presenter was having all sorts of issues with the slides. Um, chat was given him problems. He completely dropped off at some point. So it happens to everybody. And though this can sometimes be hilarious, it's resulted in some, this kind of clumsy way to directly try and recreate what works in the face-to-face -face world. Um, and But this has kind of happened before. It's also kind of similar to when websites first started or when they were new. People weren't really sure what they were supposed to do. Um, are they supposed to be a brochure? Is it a replacement for the office? What is it supposed to do? So we saw a lot of things like, hey, welcome to our website. And what we've learned from that is online operates a lot differently than in person, right? So it's a continuation of a trend that we've been talking about at Trivera for a while where someone will visit your website eight to 12 times before they're willing to give you any information about themselves. So even though you wanna push for that instant conversation, you can't really necessarily treat it like a sales meeting. Um, Christina uses analogy often that I like and I think is fitting for the space where you're not really looking to get married on the first date unless you're on a reality show or something. Um, you're getting some coffee, you're going on a couple dates, you're learning about somebody. Um, in the digital space, people are searching and comparing and interacting in different ways before that conversion or purchase is made. And they've been even moved more in that direction because of COVID. So in this slide, um, you can see sort of how much things have moved online from a B2C standpoint from a McKinsey study that came out in December. And we sort of expect this to carry over in the B2B world. Um, as you see here, 51% of people expect virtual elements to remain even after live events return. And there was another study um, from the 614 group um, called the future of in-person business economy um, and they're a marketing research group out of New York, they saw a 34% uptick in the same belief in the fall versus in the spring when it was first asked. And so because of this, um, it's important to remember that you're not only competing with who you think your direct competition is, you're competing with every online experience your customer may be having, regardless of whether or not it's in your same industry. 
and those expectations are continuously changing. So even if we don't love the virtual world all the time and it doesn't work as well and it's not perfect, we still need to adapt and get on board. So now let's think about something that we're all experiencing, which is every day feels the same. You're sitting in the same room all alone, probably doing your work, staring at multiple screens and it's affecting us. So I just want to take another quick poll so that I can get a sense of what you guys have been experiencing. So let me launch that quick. There's two questions. There are uh, one answer for each. So not as much reading this time. First, we want to know if you guys have noticed any changes to the effectiveness of your marketing efforts. Uh, maybe everything works as well as it has before. Maybe things don't work quite as well, or they seem to be working, but maybe differently. You're not quite sure why. And then the second question is, how did your organization respond to the social justice events? Did you feel the need to respond, but took the time? Did you, were you clear on where you stood and it was easy for you to figure out how to respond? Or did you feel that it wasn't right for you to address these issues publicly? I'll give everybody a couple of minutes, not a couple of minutes, a few seconds to respond to this. Alrighty, I'm gonna end the poll and I will show you the results. So I think you'll be interested as we start to talk more about this because what you guys are experiencing is very typical to everybody. So you can see the majority of people here today say that your marketing efforts seem to be working but the results are different. And I'll show you a little bit about why that is. And then you can see also that a lot of people did feel the need to respond but took some time to discuss it internally before publicly responding. So I'm gonna stop sharing those results. And we'll move on. Thanks for participating. So what's going on with all of us? We are online all the time. And I'm sure you've experienced this yourself, but what experts are calling this is COVID fatigue. So basically, it's the result of a continuous exposure to stress and a constant stream of information. I don't know about you, but I have three screens in front of me pretty much all day long. And we are all suffering from something related called digital fatigue. And so the way that that's impacting our online experiences, the biggest thing is that traditional day parts no longer exist. So if you look at the chart on the screen, you will see that this social baker study, which occurred in the US and in the UK, showed that after we went into lockdown, 5 a.m. use of Facebook grew by 98%. So people are hopping online earlier than they ever have before. Now, on the other hand, I read in another study, which of course I couldn't go back and find, that work, it said that workers are starting work later in the day than they used to. And they're working later to make up for the, either the late start or middle of the day interruptions. You know, we like to think about marketing, especially if you're in a B2B role, marketing to people who are at their desks focused on their jobs. But now you might be doing this right now. And as soon as you're done, you're going to go make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for somebody. So our work and our home lives have become very intermingled. And really the bottom line of this stat is we used to say to do things like send all of your business e related emails by the end of the day or do your social posts at a specific time. That's really not true anymore. And the problem with all of this continuous online exposure, whether it's work or personal, is it's leading to a phenomenon called caution fatigue. So Dr. Jacqueline Gollin, who is the Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at Northwestern University, defines this as the constant state of being alert, which activates cortisol in our brains, and that affects our health and our brain function. So we're subjected to high levels of stress, and then we start to desensitize to the stress. And that can lead to us not paying attention to risky situations. And I'm sure you have all seen some not so great behavior, particularly on social media. And you can see how people are just, like we're all hanging on by our last nerve. And why is that? Well, part of it is because of everything that's happened. But another big part of it is we went into 2020 with a trust deficit. So this information comes from the 2020 Edelman Trust Barometer, which they've been doing this trust survey for probably about 20 years. And the theme for 2020 
was competence and ethics. And this came out almost a year ago in February before all of this stuff happened. But even back then, 55% of people were afraid of being left behind. Nearly half of people felt the system was failing them. 83% of people feared losing their job. And 61% of people felt that the government didn't understand technology well enough to regulate it. And no institutions, not nonprofit, not the government, and not business were seen as both competent and ethical, which puts us in a crazy situation. So you've got these people who don't trust anything around them dealing with all of this uncertainty and constant online exposure and constant stress. So where are we at? Well, we're all on edge. We suffer from a lack of trust. We filter our news to show us only what we want to hear or what we already agree with. And if we're not actively filtering it ourselves, our social media feeds are doing it for us because they show you more of what you interact with. And then as we head into 2021, issues like climate change, social justice, and politics are not going to go away. Our next normal is going to include all of these challenges. The fourth pattern um, is where we get to a little bit of SEO. So you remember you're at a Trivera webinar um, is that Google is always one step ahead and they basically know everything about you. Um, so Google updated their search quality evaluator guidelines back in October and there's a lot of information about trust in it. This document is like 100 pages long, but you can see from some of the bullet points here. Basically, they're telling their evaluators to double check claims that are made on a site. And they do use Wikipedia, um, even though teachers and professors may hate it, Google doesn't. Um, YouTube and Facebook use it to flag things like conspiracy theories and um, source their news stories. Um, Amazon, Apple, Google all use it to search and answer questions for voice queries on like Alexa and Siri. And the WHO is even working with um, Wikipedia to try to fight some COVID-19 misinformation. So we also wanted to quickly recap some important updates that Google made in 2019 that were pretty significant in the search space. Um, one of those was called BERT, which is just a cute acronym for an AI that was a new way for Google to process language more easily. So it helped Google better understand the context behind a set of keywords that are searched together in a query versus just the order that those keywords were being used in. And it's just another step in the direction of Google lessening the importance of individual keywords and search is becoming more of a conversation. So because they continue to improve machine learning and language understanding, they're able to deliver more relevant results and more quickly. And then there was an algorithm update in November of 2019 that focused on improving local SEO using neural matching. This is also AI-based system that um, Google actually began using in 2018 to try and understand how words are more related to concepts. So they told us to think of it as like a super synonym system. And the example that they gave was if you search for um, why does my TV look strange, you're going to get a lot of results for something called the soap opera effect, which none of those keywords match in those, right? But the neural matching algorithm looked at sort of that more vaguely descriptive query, converted it into a semantic pattern, matched it to millions of web documents, and then delivered that relevant content. And so we also know that Google is always updating and evolving, which can make SEOs and digital marketers like the three of us feel like we're trying to herd cats. Um, but at the end of the day, they're trying to make results as relevant as possible. And though there's thousands of updates every year, 2020 being no different, um, there was three major core updates that we just kind of wanted to touch upon a little bit. And though Google doesn't really give us the information on the specific details of what goes on in these updates, the digital industry notices and analyzes and reports on what they're seeing in the space. So in January, the most notable shift came from what they call YMYL. Uh, which stands for your money or your life. And this includes industries like health, finance, travel. And then in May 2020, there was another broad update that focused on user signals and affected industries like 
real estate, travel, and health. And then most recently in December of this past year, we're not really sure what this update affected yet. Um, patterns people are seeing are still sort of being investigated. There was a quote that came out from um, someone at Google when they were trying to figure out what the update was. And I actually just found out this tweet came from the book, The Little Prince, but they tweeted, what is essential is invisible to the eye. So you can kind of draw your own conclusions on what that exactly means, but there's some speculation that Google may have made changes like paying more attention to headings and content structure, that UX was a factor, or that it may be related to a new Smith algorithm update. And so SMITH stands for Siamese Multi-Depth Transformer-Based Hierarchical Encoder. It's a lot of big words I'm not smart enough to understand, but similar to the BERT algorithm, it's designed to understand the context behind words. So while BERT was more limited to understanding short documents, SMITH is designed to understand like entire passages and context of large documents. So it's learning the relationship between words and then sort of leveling up to learn the context of blocks of sentences, and then even leveling up from there to understand how all that relates into a long form document. So Smith is sort of supplementing BERT by doing some of the heavy lifting that BERT couldn't do. And so where does that leave us for what to expect for this year? Um, Google sometimes likes to keep us on our toes and not really announce updates um, unless they're big or core updates. However, due to COVID last year and probably just 2020 in general, um, they gave us a pretty big heads up on a future algorithm update, which will be happening this year. And it's centered around page experience. They're basically looking at how usable your site is. So, Google announced um, this page experience update. And just to note that this is not anything really that's new or groundbreaking in the space, but it's building upon things that we already know are important. So it's aggregating all of these signals into like one more important ranking factor that could have overall greater impact to search results. And the first part of this update is what you see here is page experience signals. And these are things Google already uses to evaluate the quality of your site. So is your site mobile friendly? Um, if you didn't know, Google is now evaluating your site based on its mobile experience first. So even if all of your traffic is coming from desktop, your mobile experience is gonna be important. And then other things like, do you have safe browsing, HTTPS? Um, do you have pop-ups that prevent main content from being read or accessed? Pro tip, please stop doing that. Um, there's a few exceptions to those pop-ups, like anything related to legal obligations or cookie usage. But for the most part, um, Google doesn't like it and it's kind of annoying for users too. <laughs> and then with these page experience updates, Google rolling in what they call core web vitals. And what these three content blocks on your screen show is basically um, Google is going to be looking at how long it takes for the main content of your page to load, how long before a user can actually interact with your page, and how much is your content moving around while those pages are loading. So one example that always sticks out to me because I find it personally annoying is when you're on a recipe site or a blog and you'll notice that there's ads in between all the content blocks. So as you're trying to scroll and view your recipe, everything's moving and shifting around, making it super annoying, making for a difficult user experience. Google doesn't like this, users don't like this. So these types of sites will probably get dinged when this update rolls around. It's sort of um, Google's way of basically telling us we should probably avoid this type of interruption marketing in order to get people's attention. I did that just for fun. <laughs> You're on mute. <laughs> <clears throat> so let's dive into some of the ways that we feel you should be able to deal with these, with these patterns. Our first recommendation is goodbye normal. Thank you, next. <clears throat> um, it's just time to make some changes and realize that what worked before might not work now. You can't just take what happened or what used to happen in person and shift it online. Take this 
uh, lunch and learn, for example, we used to do we used to do it in one and a half hours, and now we try to power through in 45 minutes. Um, but and that's just because of the fatigue we talked about earlier. Um, <clears throat> I think the other thing you have to remember is that you'll be needing to make smaller touch points with your audience and that that might make your funnel feel longer, but actually it's just that you'll be aware with, you'll be aware of people sooner. And what can you do about all this? Just uh, be everywhere, be active and helpful on social media. Think about starting some inbound marketing, uh, keep up with your content creation. And when it comes to content creation, start writing about the same topics uh, multiple times. We call that content clusters, which really gives some good signals to Google regarding your authority. And if you're not doing pay-per-click or display advertising or social media boosting or advertising in that space, give it a try. Um, the second recommendation that we have is to create some dashboards. So this is going to allow you to measure and, and plan and react more quickly because you can't really um, use an understanding of your past to sort of see what's coming around corners, right? So this is going to be in combination with any sort of more regular in-depth reporting that you're doing. And then, um, as Jackie just mentioned, there's also a value in um, PPC and social ads, um, social listening, even if it's just for the data, because both can sort of help anticipate and identify some of those trends quickly. And then if you have a Google Analytics account, um, if you don't, it's a good idea to create one. It's a free tool. Um, but create a G4 property in your Google Analytics account. It's basically the new version of Google Analytics, but it has machine learning at its core. So it's going to help identify some insights more quickly across devices and platforms. All right, our next recommendation is to be thinking about your marketing as more of an always on activity versus planning bursts of campaigns. Now that doesn't mean you can't do a campaign, but we need to recognize that first of all, traditional day parts no longer exist. People are online at all sorts of crazy times and that some people start work earlier or later. They might work late at night or on the weekends or they don't. So you kind of need to always be there so that you can meet people where they're at. Know that their audience might not be online and they might not respond the way you typically want them to or they might respond really well on the weekends when maybe that never worked before. Um, I think the biggest thing to do is to pay attention to whatever data you can get from your website, from your emails, from your social, and try to measure meaningful metrics. So not just views or impressions, but how much time are people spending on your website? How many pages are you getting per visit? Where are they going? So really dig deep and try to figure out not just the vanity stuff, but is this actually working? And then don't be afraid to adjust the timing of social posts or email deliveries as you need to. But be sure to remember that patience is a virtue. So don't shut campaigns or anything that you're doing off without giving them a chance to work. Tweak before you delete. And then along that same vein, you might want to try things that didn't necessarily work in the past. This graph came, comes from a social baker study, which showed that long, like more than five minute long videos performed better on social media than the second best video length, which was also long. If you look at what we would typically think, which would be a very short video, that is at the bottom of the chart. So the crazy thing is that normally we would always think if you're going to post something to social media, it needs to be less than 30 seconds that might not be the case anymore. So if you tried something once and it didn't work, you might want to try it again. Or now might be a time to test something that you've always thought should work, but maybe you were never brave enough to try it. User experience and people's habits are all over the place now. So if you can handle it, try something new. Okay, our fifth recommendation is to be ready for a crisis. 
Not that the pandemic was one of the personas that you were ready for, but uh, you should be ready and make sure that your core values, uh, that you know your core values and you use them as your guiding speaking points. It will make messaging easier when it comes to crazy world events. Stay true to your brand. We know that brands that demonstrate a positive impact on people's lives grow faster than brands that, um, <clears throat> that don't. Brands that stay true to themselves have happier employees and actually outperform the stock market. And consumers can really see through a brand that, that just jumps on a popular cause that's not authentic to them. So stay authentic to yourself and to your brand. And then also don't forget the importance of your employees as communicators. Like we mentioned earlier uh, in terms of the trust barometer, keep your employees in the loop, make sure that they know what's happening, build their confidence and <clears throat> keep them on message as well. Because we know that any employee these days can be a spokesperson for your company or your brand. The sixth and final recommendation that we have is around trust um, keywords and content creation for SEO. So the first portion of this is trust being in that you can't really just say you're trustworthy, right? You have to sort of prove it. And sometimes it can be simple things like, do you have contact about us privacy policy pages on your site? Um, is it secure? Do you have a social presence and are people engaging with that? It's also things like, are you getting good reviews? Are you getting links from other relevant trustworthy sites? These are all important trust indicators. And then on the technical side, can search engines crawl your site effectively? So site technical health is something that we preach at Trivera and you will hear it on repeat. You might, you're gonna get bored of it in that you can't do SEO to a broken site because not only is it important for search engines, it's important to your users because it provides a better experience. So you can have the most amazing content on the planet, but it's not going to matter if your site is broken and people can't find the content. And then on the content creation end, um, as we've talked about, Google is smart enough to understand that keywords don't work the way that they used to. So they're understanding the intent behind what people are searching. So when you're creating content, think about um, creating those traffic clusters that Jackie mentioned earlier and how customers are finding you or even potentially how they're finding your competitors, but they're not finding you. Um, words that they're using and not the stress here, not words that you want them to use, but words that your customers are actually using. And then create multiple pieces of content around each of those topics that link to each other because this just helps um, Google connect that content together and identify or understand where you're an authority. And so the bottom line with a few of these last points is that we know SEO is no longer about stuffing a bunch of keywords on a page. It hasn't been for a while. Um, it's about more integrated, comprehensive, super helpful, ongoing combination of PR, marketing, customer service. So smart keyword research that drives that meaningful copy and good writing to answer questions for people. So as we say, it's, you should go easy on the marketing fluff um, and focus on the technical health of your site. All righty, so we are at the end and we know that we threw a lot of conflicting data at you and a bunch of ideas. So if you can only remember three things from what we told you today, the first thing is to know that search engine optimization is changing fast and every day. And keyword research definitely still matters. You should do it, but don't be afraid to experiment thing with things. Remember that the traditional day parts no longer exist. So sometimes super long videos do better, except for when they don't. And paid social might be the way to go, except for when it's not. So don't be afraid to try something new. Nobody knows what lies ahead. So use whatever data you can get your hands on to anticipate changes and to measure your results and tweak before you delete. And finally, one of the most important things we wanna emphasize is that trust matters. It matters to Google, so it needs to matter to you because Google is one of your target audiences. 
So establish your expertise all across the web on your social accounts, on your LinkedIn profiles, through your website, through your advertising. Google can connect all of that. So make sure that you know what you stand for so that you're ready in a crisis, you and all of your employees, so that you can communicate consistently and continue to build that trust with Google. So I don't know if anyone had any questions. We didn't have any throw any up in the chat, but if you do um, throw them up there, we'd be happy to answer them right now. Otherwise, I'm gonna say thank you. Thanks for being here. We really appreciate your time. And thanks to Jackie and Ivana for doing this with me. I hope you all have a fantastic day.